Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm David Rubin. I'm at the University of Chicago. I'm one of the co-founders of Cornerstones Health, and uh, I am delighted to be here with you tonight. This is the second time we're doing this program, which was really innovative and exciting, and we're pleased that despite your very busy and stressful schedules, you've chosen to spend a little time with us to go over the best of UEGW and the best of ACG. Uh, I'm delighted to be a co-director of this program with Marla Dubinsky, who's at the Icon School of Medicine and Chief of Pediatric GI at Mount Sinai and also the other co-founder of Cornerstones. Cornerstones Health is a nonprofit organization that we created to address what we felt were the educational gaps in teaching our colleagues about taking care of IBD. And the bottom line of everything Cornerstones Health does is that we want people who participate in our programs to turn around the very next day or with the very next patient they see and deliver better care. And over the years, since 2008, when we started this organization, we have delivered a number of different types of programs, including our Best of DDW program, which we've done now for 11 years. And this is the first year we're doing a Best of UEGW combined with a Best of ACG, focused primarily on clinical trials. And we're really excited not only that we have a diverse group of presenters for you this evening, but also that we were able to record some of our colleagues presenting their first author uh, uh, abstracts at these meetings, and you'll be hearing directly from them tonight. We'd also like to encourage you to check out our website, learn about some of the other programs Cornerstones offers to our colleagues and to trainees and people who just finished fellowship. Go to cornerstoneshealth.org. So as I mentioned, Marla and I are the co-directors of this program, but we're also delighted to welcome two of our colleagues who are also presenting this evening. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Spencer is an assistant professor in pediatrics, also at the Icon School of Medicine and the Mount Sinai Medical Center. And Sashila Dalal works with me, and she's an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Chicago. We also were really delighted to have two of our good friends and colleagues in the UK, Peter Irving and James Lindsay, help us with some of the content development. And as you're gonna see shortly, we have our colleague Silvio Danesi from Italy, Iris Dotan from Israel, Bill Sanborn from the US and California, and Severine Vermeer from Belgium, all presenting alongside of us, but uh, in pre-recorded segments that you'll hear about. So the learning objectives for this program are fairly straightforward. We really hope that we will be providing you with the key clinical trial data that were presented at our national and international meetings so that you'll know about the pipeline of new therapies that are coming for IBD, as well as existing therapies that were studied in new ways. I'd like to just give you a general um, picture of all the different targets that are under development and are of interest in managing IBD. In this cartoon, what I will orient you to is that the top of the screen represents the lumen inside the gut. Then, of course, you see the epithelial cell layer, the intraepithelial space, as well as the subepithelial space. And then represented in this cartoon as well are lymph nodes, which are on the right side of the screen, and even blood vessels, which are at the bottom of the screen. And you can see all the different potential targets that have been part of our understanding of potential therapies for inflammatory bowel disease, starting inside the lumen and working its way through the epithelial cells into the subepithelial space, cellular as well as cytokine-based targets. So of course, you know our anti-TNF therapies, and you can see some of where these, these therapies act on uh, the cytokines of TNF-alpha. You also should appreciate 
the uh, cytokine, uh, sorry, the cellular and leukocyte trafficking inhibitor cells, uh, uh, therapies etralizumab, natalizumab, and vetalizumab, which essentially prevent lymphocytes from migrating through the endothelial cells of blood vessels into the epithelial space. You can also appreciate the anti-P40 IL-1223 inhibitor used to kinemab and some of the locations in which this is believed to uh, act, as well as the P19 inhibitors, which are pure IL-23 inhibitors, of which you notice that there are four in development. We'll be talking about a couple of those tonight as well. And then there are the S1P receptor modulators. We'll be teaching you a bit more about this a new mechanism of action in which they actively um, inhibit migration of activated lymphocytes from the mesenteric lymph nodes. So a new mechanism of action, but also cellular in its uh, primary mechanism. And then lastly, our jaconibs, which are the Janus kinase inhibitors. We of course have tofacitinib as a non-selective jack that's available. And then we have our selective JAK1s that are all in development for both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So throughout the program and then at the end, we're going to be highlighting some of these different therapies in phase two, phase three, as well as some additional data we have for the available and licensed therapies that are listed here. And you can see across these different mechanisms of actions and classes of therapies, how rich the pipeline is. And I'll just remind everyone that one of the biggest challenges we face is getting enough patients recruited into these clinical trials so that we can get them done and know whether they have the efficacy and safety that we need in order to continue moving the field forward. So with that introduction, it's really my pleasure to uh, introduce Marla Dubinsky, who's gonna take over for the next section here. Marla, you're up. Wonderful, thank you. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us. As Dave noted, we're very excited to be bringing you this new program. Uh, our goal was to bring over to um, North America really the latest and greatest top line trials. Now, within that, there's also therapies that we're used to using and have been using for years, but just a different take on it to try and help address some of the questions that were raised around the time of approval. We're gonna start with the Serene program and introduce both adalimumab for UC and Crohn's. The first one we're gonna start with is Serene Crohn's. What I wanted to highlight is a lot of the background behind Serene was really driven by, since the magic of getting these therapies, particularly anti-TNF, to have its best effect, likely happens due to the issues regarding um, drug concentrations is if you hire, have a higher induction dosing. And this is exactly what was tested with adalimumab. What they did is for the induction part of Serene Crohn's, they compared patients who received high dose induction, which is actually 160 four weeks in a row compared to, as we know, the standard, which is 160 just on week zero. And then they followed it up with 40 milligrams every other week. And on standard, as you know, 160, 80, and then 40 milligrams every other week. That was the induction trial. The second phase of Serene, which is interesting, uh, as well was to say that maybe in maintenance, the way to keep a patient having better outcomes is if we adjust the dosing specific to a targeted drug concentration, using drug levels to actually drive dosing and compare that to just clinically adjusting adalimumab based on symptoms. The co-primary endpoints for induction was week four and week 12, and then we'll look at the maintenance data in just a moment. So interestingly, despite us thinking this was a big dosing issue and why maybe infliximab had better induction data for naive Crohn's patients, for example, bio-naive, what you can see here that even in patients who got 160 weekly for four weeks in a row at week four did not have a difference compared to 160-80 for clinical remission at week four. And then even when you added endoscopy at week 12, looking at a change of SCSCD of at least 50%, again, numerically a very small difference, but insignificant. So it looks like the dosing we have now approved is not different in terms of outcomes. Now, when it comes to the maintenance, which is really the part that I was noting would be very interesting to see if we targeted a drug concentration somewhere between five and 10, would we get better outcomes at the end of maintenance, at the end of a year, for example, versus just adjusting your dose based on signs and symptoms. 
So when we looked at what were the criteria, this slide outlines for you that obviously in the clinically adjusted group, we just adjusted it based on a CDAI score, which as a reminder includes how are you doing, general well-being, which we know is a sub very subjective outcome, but they did add an objective marker of a CRP elevation. And so it was showing you that essentially if a patient had either CDAI elevation or and or CRP that was high, you could adjust to every week dosing versus the TDM arm, which is using drug concentration somewhere between five and 10, combining it with symptoms and CRP. But if a patient had any CDAI or any CRP but had a drug concentration less than five, they can go to weekly. Next slide. So again, just like what we saw with induction, it appears that across the board, whether you use symptoms with adalimumab to dose adjust proactively versus using a level somewhere between five and 10, you actually did not see a difference for any of the endpoints at week 56. Again, suggesting that with a drug that you're giving every two weeks, your clinical acuity performed as well as a drug concentration between five and 10. Let's move on to ulcerative colitis. Oh, sorry, this is just the outcome of the actual uh, week 56. Again, making the claim again, what I just said is that even the primary outcome of clinical remission was no different, bringing into question whether or not we need TDM for adalimumab. When we look at ulcerative colitis, this I think is even more interesting, the concept, because Unlike Crohn's disease, where there wasn't a feeling that the dose was off when it was approved, with ulcerative colitis, the, the assumption was at the time in 2011 when it was approved for ulcerative colitis, the question was, could it be that the outcomes we saw with adalimumab and ulcerative colitis were not as good as infliximab because of dosing, even more than Crohn's, to be fair. This was really a post-marketing commitment. What they did, similar to Crohn's, Serene, 160 weekly for induction saying, hey, we can get the drug concentrations up. We're going to get better outcomes early on um, at the time of randomization, for example, at week eight. And then follow different than UC Crohn's, I mean, Serene Crohn's, where they actually looked at every week planned, stratified versus every other week. And then the exploratory arm was a drug concentration arm but they escalated to a drug concentration between 10 and 20, suggesting you need better drug concentrations for ulcerative colitis because of the feeling of the colon sink, sort of patients losing TNF through their uh, inflammatory colon. So let's look at the results. What I wanna say is that the induction data, which was presented historically at DDW, is that despite 160 weekly for induction, the only outcome that was different than 160, 80, 40 was clinical response, not endoscopic change, not remission. So I think it's important for us to understand that right now, high dose induction with ADA does not appear to be any different in induction from uh, standard dosing. This is the endpoint at week 52 where patients either got every week planned versus every other week, and then a therapeutic drug monitoring arm. What I do wanna make note is we highlight excluding the cohort from Japan. People may ask, why are we excluding a cohort from Japan? I will tell you the difference. One, in this study where it was excluded, they actually did not see a difference between every other week and every week from a p-value significance. You can see the numerical difference of about 10%. When they added the Japanese cohort in, they actually met a p-value less than 0.05. So what this conclusion was, there was no safety disadvantage of every week. I do wanna note that the therapeutic drug monitoring arm, although not powered, came close to looking somewhere in between every other week and every week. Question is, is 10 to 20 enough of a drug concentration for ADA? We don't really have that data to suggest that we need to go higher at this point. So let's summarize dose intensification, upfront and induction, and then uh, stratify. This you see summary is the following. We had about 37% of patients that were active, that were adjusted by proactive TDM. So there was at least a third of patients who had drug concentrations less than 10. And this is the TDM summary, about 84% of TDM patients were receiving every week. So it suggests that if you use a drug concentration, most of your patients don't get a drug concentration of 10 to 20 on every other week dosing. We did not see an efficacy difference at week between every week and every other week. 
And at this point, we cannot say that there's a benefit of using a TDM arm specifically, but we need to investigate this data further. And I just wanted to share with you, most importantly, is the induction piece did not appear to be different when you use 160 weekly. We need more data to understand why this was the case since we assumed it was a dosing issue. Let's move on to the pediatric UC study. Speaking about adalimumab and UC, this was actually um, the efficacy and safety of ADA in pediatric UC. This is the controlled phase three study. I want to show you the data called Envision 1. So let's start with the study design, which is interesting in itself. As you can imagine, anywhere where placebo was in a pediatric clinical trial for a drug that was approved years before the trial started, is a non-starter. We started that way, and as, as we plug through, you'll see a lot of Xs throughout this trial. We took away the randomization induction. We actually took away then the placebo and maintenance because there was no way a parent was placing a child on a drug that they can get approved through insurance is a drug we've been using in adults. It did not feel that there was that it was ethically sound. So the design changed completely. You could see that we dose kids based on 2.4 milligrams per kilogram until a maximum of the approved uh, dosing. But one thing that was different from adults and peds that you can see that there's 160 at week zero and one which is different than the approved dose from adults. So you will see a little bit of a difference in the pediatric approval. So let's go to the, uh, go to the, go to the results now. What I wanted to show you is that whether you use high dose adalimumab in maintenance, meaning uh, higher dose every week, standard dosing adalimumab, or put them all together, didn't matter how you looked at this data, it looks across the board that they look very similar. So pediatric maintenance, it looks like if we get them into remission at week eight, we're able to keep them at a high proportion, which is something we see in clinical practice. A lot of our outcomes, including infliximab, tend to be better. Now, whether that's because we're dosing them more accurately, because this was based on milligram per kilogram in the younger, in the lesser weight patient, it's the same thing we see with the used tekinumab trial in pediatrics, the same thing we see with infliximab. So I think we're just dosing patients better when we're giving fixed dosing. So the conclusions is that Granted, it was the largest phase three trial we've actually had. It took us a while to get the enrollment. It required a lot of protocol changes, as we showed you. There was definitely cleaning, clinically meaningful rates of response and remission, including all of outcomes, including mucosal healing in children with much severely active UC on adalimumab, and it was well tolerated. You'll begin to see the dosing that will be approved for pediatric ulcerative colitis. It will be a little bit different, a little bit higher actually, so I'm excited for that, because we're gonna actually have um, good dosing for pediatric UC patients with adalimumab. I'm happy to introduce uh, Dr. Elizabeth Spencer, who's going to take it to the next section. Lizzie? Yeah. So Marla just talked to us about an, a new take on an old favorite, and I'm going to tell you about another new take on an old favorite with Vetalizumab sub-Q. So these are the interim results, two-year results, from Visible 1, the open-label extension trial. So if you look at the next slide, um, there, I'll just kind of reorient you to what Visible One was and who went into this open label extension trial. So everybody in Visible One got 300 milligrams of betalizumab um, at zero and two. And then if they had a response at six weeks, they then got randomized to a double dummy, um, double blind uh, maintenance phase where they either got placebo, sub-Q betalizumab or IV betalizumab. And then if they made it to week 52, they were going into this randomized week 52 completers part of the open label extension. If they weren't able to complete after being randomized, they were put into another category of the early withdrawals. And then if they didn't respond at week six period, they were given a third dose of vetalizumab IV. If they responded at week 14, they could then also go into the open label extension, but classified as this non-randomized week 14 responders. Um, so if we move on, we can talk about what were the results from Visible One to kind of just remind you um, what they found. And you can see here that in all three endpoints, clinical remission, endoscopic improvement, and a durable clinical response to that week 52, uh, there was a very, there was a significant difference between placebo and betalizumab sub-Q. And betalizumab sub-Q and IV looked very similar across the board. So then if we look at the durability, 
Um, these are that specific cohort of the randomized completers. Um, but you can see that once they got to a year's time, they actually, it was very durable and most stayed very stably uh, in clinical remission over time up to two years. And then if you will show the more refractory group here, um, these are again the group that got a, a third dose of vetalizumab IV, responded at week 14, and then went into receiving the sub-Q dose. And they also had a, actually a very durable response, about 40 to 50% remained in clinical remission up to two years. Um, and then it's important always to talk about the safety. Were there, was there a big difference in the safety data between sub-Q and IV? And no new events were noticed between sub-Q and IV. There was a, rate, a low rate of um, a reactions to the injection, which we expect we've seen that with all the other injections. It was a bit higher in visible one at about 10%, but then in visible two, it was only 2%. So it's likely very similar to all the other injection medications. Beyond that, the safety data were all mild to moderate, mainly just nasopharyngitis um, and URIs, which we already know from betalizumab. Um, so all told, it looks very safe, very durable, um, and really induces the same sort of remission response that betalizumab IV does. So a really great option for our patients uh, coming up hopefully next year. All right, well, thank you, Lizzie. Uh, I'm going to now present the uh, data for etralizumab with the help of a couple of our colleagues. Uh, so this is the summary of induction and maintenance outcomes from a really ambitious and robust program for etralizumab and ulcerative colitis, the phase three hibiscus, hickory, gardenia, and laurel studies. So just to remind everyone about uh, this uh, really quite incredible program, you can see that hibiscus one and two randomized etralizumab, which is an anti-beta-7 therapy. It's another anti-integrant therapy, slightly different target than betalizumab. Uh, and the first studies there, hibiscus one and two, compared etro to adalimumab versus placebo with a head-to-head -head superiority design of etro versus ada. Then there was the Laurel study, which was etro open label induction and then randomization to etro versus placebo in the maintenance phase. Gardenia, which was an induction and maintenance trial of etro versus infliximab with a straight uh, treat, treat through design, head to head superiority. Hickory, which was um, the one induction and then maintenance trial of etro versus placebo, a couple different arms there, and then Cottonwood, which is an open label extension and safety monitoring study. And the summary of all these different studies and whether they met their endpoints or not is in the table on the right. You can appreciate that while uh, uh, etralizumab has achieved some of its endpoints in induction. It failed to meet some of its maintenance endpoints, and it also didn't meet its induction hibiscus 2 endpoint. So now let me move on to the next slide, which is the results. Did I skip the video? Hold on one second. This video from our colleague, Yuri Stotan. So this is the first pre-recorded video we have, and I'm going to put it in now, and hopefully this is going to work properly. Hello, I'm Iris Dotan from the Rabin Medical Center in Petah Tikva, Israel, and today I'd like to present to you our UEGW 2020 late-breaking abstract, etrolizumab compared with adalimumab or placebo as induction therapy for ulcerative colitis. Results from the randomized phase 3 hibiscus 1 and 2 trials. Etrolizumab is a novel gut-targeted anti-integrin. It has a dual mechanism of action whereby anti-beta-7 monoclonal antibody selectively targets alpha-4 beta-7 and alpha-E beta-7 integrins uh, expected to control both trafficking of immune cells into the gut and their inflammatory effects in the gut lining. Hibiscus-1 and 2 studies were designed in order to evaluate the superiority of utrilizumab versus placebo or versus dadalimumab for induction in patients with moderately to severely active ulcerative colitis who were anti-TNF naive. Uh, these randomized phase three studies had their primary endpoint at week 10, and primary endpoint was defined as induction of remission at week 10 compared with placebo, and remission was defined as Mayo Clinic score two or lower uh, with individual subscores of one or lower and the rectal bleeding subscore of zero. 
Overall, the baseline characteristics were uh, evenly distributed across, across all study arms and in both studies. This is the study disposition. 358 patients were enrolled in the Hibiscus 1 and Hibiscus 2 studies. And of note, a high proportion of patients uh, uh, reached the week 10 measurement point. The primary endpoint of Hibiscus 1 and 2 is presented here. In Hibiscus 1, the primary endpoint of remission at week 10 was met. Significantly more patients achieved remission at week 10 with atrolizumab. It was 19.4% of patients uh, compared to 6.9% uh, of patients treated with placebo. In Hibiscus 2, however, the primary endpoint of remission at week 10 was not met. There was no difference in remission at week 10 between patients receiving atrolizumab, which was 18.2%, compared with placebo, which was 11.1%. The key secondary endpoints for Hibiscus 1 and 2 are presented. And in a pooled analysis of comparing etrolizumab versus adalimumab, etrolizumab was not superior to adalimumab for induction of remission, endoscopic improvement, clinical response, histological remission, or endoscopic remission at week 10 as presented. The safety summary is presented here, and most adverse events were non-serious and grade one or two. There were no new or unexpected safety, safety signals. There were two fatalities that were reported, both occurred in the etrolizumab arm and were uh, con considered unrelated to, uh, to treatment. There were no confirmed cases of PML in these studies. So to summarize, our summary statement is as follows. Overall, mixed results were demonstrated in the Hibiscus 1 and 2 studies. As etrolizumab met, as etrolizumab met the primary endpoint of inducing remission at week 10 versus placebo in patients with moderately to severely active ulcerative colitis who are anti-TNF naive in Hibiscus 1, but not Hibiscus 2. The pooled analysis did not show a superiority of etrolizumab over adalimumab for week 10 endpoints, and etrolizumab treatment was well tolerated in anti-TNF naive patients with moderately to severely active ulcerative colitis. Okay, I think I did. And now we're back to me. Uh, so I also want to share with you the results of the Gardenia study, which I had mentioned to you was in TNF-naive patients, where they uh, looked at etrolizumab compared to infliximab. Uh, as I mentioned, quite an ambitious study design. Uh, and you can appreciate in this uh, these results here that whether you looked at response at week 10 and remission at week 54, which was a co-primary point, endpoint, or endoscopic remission at week 54, or any of these other uh, endpoints, there was not a statistical difference between etro or infliximab. So while you, you would call this a negative study, you can certainly see there was a signal for etro and there's ongoing evaluation and discussions about this, as well as the Crohn's related studies with etro, which are still ongoing. Moving on, I'm, I'm happy to introduce you to the Stardust trial, which is a treat to target trial in Crohn's disease with ustekinumab. And we were fortunate enough to have our colleague Silvio Danese present this for us. So now I'm going to pull up Silvio's video here. And we're going to hear from Silvio. We get to see him too. Hello to everybody. My name is Silvio Danese from Humanitas Research Hospital in Milan. And it's a real pleasure to present you the data of the Stardust. The Stardust trial is the first treat to target study that investigates the benefits of a treat to target strategy with two stekinumab therapy combined with early endoscopic assessment compared to a clinically driven standard of care approach. Let me walk you through the study design in order to be a little bit more uh, clear. So these are patients with moderate to severe Crohn's disease that have a CDI between 220 and 450 and a CCD of at least three points, either biologic naive or exposed to one biologic that after endoscopy have been receiving ustekinumab according to the classical induction of six milligram IV 
and then 90 milligram sub Q at week eight. And uh, this is the first point. This is the first target. As you know, CDI 70 response is the first target for patients responding. They could continue in the study. And patients were randomized into two groups. This is actually the second part because half of the patients according to their uh, drop of CCD at 16 weeks were continued in a schedule of every eight weeks if the drop was below 25% or every 12 weeks if the drop was above 25%. And then the same patients continued in the trip to target arm monitored, and this is the tight control part monitored for uh, um, fecal calpro and CRP. On the contrary, the other half of the patients were randomized to the standard of care group in which typically, according to the European label, patients could receive dose optimization of ustekinumab up to eight weeks. And the primary point, which is the third target, was endoscopic response at week 48. So differences in CCD drop of 50%. So these are all the adjustments that occurred, and as, as I said, symptoms, fecal calpro, and CRP. And if patients do not achieve the target, they are removed from the study. This is a huge study. It's a very robust study with over 680 patients assessed. Something that I want to draw your attention is that there is a very high drop um, in the treat to target as compared to the standard of care, because of course, if we are too ambitious, it's possible that patient will not copy or will not achieve the target. These are all the dose distribution with all the assessment in the treat to target, it was possible also to optimize every four weeks, as you see here in about 17% of patients. And uh, this is the primary endpoint, numerically higher in 37% of patients in the trip to target as compared to 29% of patients in the standard of care. And uh, something that is relevant is that the drug did perform extremely well in both terms in terms of response, CDI 100 response, remission, these are all the analysis, and actually also in terms of drop in CDI score over time, and also in terms of biological response. So I would say that overall, and including the safety, with no problems of uh, new safety signals between the treat to target or the standard of care. So this overall leads to the conclusion that in this first randomized treat to target trial, we could not detect a uh, difference, a significant difference in the treat to target, but still this produced a numerically higher endoscopic response than standard of care with excellent clinical remission and biomarker response in both arms with a great safety of the drug. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, well, thank you, Silvio. Uh, so uh, although there wasn't a statistically significant difference, there was a higher number of patients who achieved that endoscopic endpoint in the treat to target arm. And uh, there's a lot to unravel here in this Stardust trial. One of the things that I'm gonna highlight now is the PK substudy. So this interim analysis describes the pharmacokinetics. It also looked at immunogenicity and the exposure response data through week 16 of Stardust. And this was performed by having blood samples collected at weeks 0, 8, and 16. And then they used an ECLIA drug tolerant assay. That means it can detect antibodies at the same time drug is present. And they also looked at clinical efficacy based on CDAI, as well as the objective measure of a centrally red endoscopy. So getting back to what we always wanna know is, is there a relationship between the amount of drug in the serum and the response to uh, the therapy for its intended effect? So these are the results looking at clinical response and clinical remission using the CDAI values. Remember, that's primarily subjective and symptom-based. And what you can see here is what we've seen with other biologics in the past, which is that some drug is clearly better than none, or at least another way to say that is that the second, third, and fourth quartiles had similar clinical results compared to that first quartile, which had the lowest level, although there was still patients who had improvement with even that low level of drug, or maybe even no drug in some of those patients. However, when you look at the objective measure of biomarker response, which is a CRP that was normalized, 
or a calprotectin that was defined as normal less than or equal to 250, you can see more of a dose response or an exposure response here where the amount of drug present in the serum correlated to a greater likelihood of these normalized objective measures, suggesting that in fact, um, the amount of circulating serum drug levels uh, correlate to better objective response. And getting to the uh, primary focus of Stardust, which was endoscopic response, you can see here similar, although perhaps not as clear cut as the CRP and CalPro, that higher circulating drug is associated with more objective responses from the endoscopy side of things. Remember that we always talk about whether this is a chicken or an egg. In other words, is it that there's more drug circulating that leads to more endoscopic response? Or is it that when patients respond to the, to the therapy and their bowel starts to heal, they end up having lower inflammatory burdens, so there's more drug that's still circulating. Either way, it's an important observation that may influence our future management. Um, so with that, I'm going to actually now hand it off to Dr. Dalal. So Sheila, you're up. All right, so moving on, we're going to look at the long-term extension of the UNIPI study, which was the phase three double-blind placebo control of ustekinumab in ulcerative colitis patients. And we'll see some similar themes um, in this data to what David had just gone over um, in the Stardust Crohn study. So in this study, <clears throat> patients that are used to kinemab 90 milligrams every eight weeks, every 12 weeks, or placebo, and made it to 44 weeks, were then able, after 56 weeks, to be dose adjusted at the clinical judgment of the investigator. So those that were on every 12 weeks could go to every eight weeks, those that were on placebo could go to every 12 weeks, and those that are on eight weeks stayed um, at eight weeks. And that dose adjustment could be done at any point um, between 56 weeks and 96 weeks. So moving on, we'll see, um, again, looking at the serum values of ustekinumab correlating with symptomatic remission, you can see really at all quartiles of ustekinumab concentration, there was a high proportion of patients that were in symptomatic remission, both at the every 12-week dosing in blue and at the every eight-week dosing in ustekinumab, so similar to what we saw um, in Stardust. Moving on then to biomarkers, um, looking at both CRP and at calprotectin, we did see more of um, a dose response with serum concentrations of ustekinumab that were higher, um, correlating um, with a higher proportion of patients with a normalized CRP um, or a normalized calprotectin. In terms of antibodies to ustekinumab, in this study overall, there was a very low proportion of patients that developed antibodies. Um, of the 400 patients that were in the study, um, only 22 of them had detectable antibodies at all. And of those 22, 81.8% of them had low titer antibodies. Only 1% of them had neutralizing antibodies. So anti-drug antibody formation rates were low. And amongst those with antibodies, um, symptomatic remission looked very similar um, to those without antibodies. So antibodies to use dekinumab really did not seem to affect efficacy. All right, terrific, Sushila. Marla, you're up. Great. So now I'm excited to present actually the next generation of similar target to what Dr. Dalal just presented, and we're going to focus on first gisilkimab, which, as Dave noted, ustekinumab is a P40 targeting both IL-12 and IL-23. We're now moving into the pure P19, which is just focusing on IL-23. So I'm going to show you first the data from the Galaxy One, which is gisilkimab. So here you see that the trial was designed such that patients were randomized to either one of three dosing of gisilkimab or a uh, reference arm, which was actually used to kinemab at the dose that's currently approved, except the induction is six milligram per kilogram IV approximately, and the fifth group was placebo as the control. So what I'm going to show you now is the uh, specific outcomes. This one was looking at mean uh, CDA, CDA, CDAI change from baseline at week 12. And what I'm showing you here is if you look, placebo obviously resulted in the lowest change. Then you could see across the board, all doses look very similar. And again, it's not to compare to ustekinumab, so it's just showing you that as a reference arm. So we did see a significant delta in patients on receiving drug compared to placebo. 
That was at week 12. Now, if we look at more specific sort of hard out endpoints other than looking at change, for example, you could see across the board, again, same concepts that all of the dosing were better than placebo if you looked at overall population. But as we know, we're all venturing into this space. When we think about sequencing of therapies, we have to address how do these drugs work in naive patients versus failures. And in this case, it was bio failure, including all different kinds of biologics, not just TNF like we're used to seeing, and then conventional therapy failure. And you could see, just like other drugs have shown, that if you haven't failed biologics, there's a slight advantage to be receiving these therapies before multiple bio failures for sure. But you can see that even compared to placebo, either group performs significantly better in terms of numerics and it also shows you the reference arm of ustekinumab. And then when we looked at sort of another way of defining remission, as you know, there's CDAI, and we've also moved towards the PRO2, which is just calling out the abdominal pain and stool frequency as it relates to Crohn's disease. And again, you could see across the board better than placebo, um, similar to the CDAI remission. And then what I, of course, what we want to focus on are these objective measures. As we know, clinical symptoms, particularly when you include sort of general well-being, which is what the CDAI, and to be fair, that's why the PRO2 sort of has evolved, because the feeling was too subjective from a patient report on how well you feel. So we focused on objective abdominal pain and stool frequency. And here you can see biomarker response, which is CalPro and CRP. Again, showing that when you have a more objective endpoint, your placebo rate drops, meaning the more legitimacy towards the outcome of measure. And you could see that all doses performed well, as well as ustekinumab. So that's the objective sort of biomarker. Let's focus on probably the ultimate objective measure, which of course is endoscopy. And again, when you look at endoscopic response, which is that change of at least 50% already at week 12, you can see here that there was a difference in all doses, again, compared to placebo. And then look at endoscopic remission. We know the higher the bar, the harder to get at your very early time point. And I think we're all accepting that an interim endoscopic endpoint early post-induction is at least a 50% drop. And that's sort of the direction that we're going. So we're glad Glad to see that these drugs, this drug class actually has that kind of objective effect. So in conclusion, all three doses were clinically meaningful compared to placebo uh, in this group of moderate to severely active Crohn's. There was um, comparable efficacy across dosing. We saw a consistent safety profile across the dosing as well, and that is leading, obviously, to the ongoing uh, phase three study of casilcomab that's actually versus ustekinumab. So I think this is going to be a really interesting time for P19s. Let's focus on the next P19 um, to come out, and I'm going to show you the uh, week 52 data of mirakizumab, which is the Eli Lilly P19, and show you the phase two serenity study. Again, the induction study, the design is here, looking at period one, which is the first randomization, where they were randomized to one of three IV doses versus placebo, and then were re-randomized. So this is unique for phase two. We re-randomized into maintenance, only those responders at week 12, and you either stayed on the IV dose that got you to response at week 12, or you got the 300 milligram sub-Q dose every four weeks, which is the goal is to bring maintenance into sub-Q. So let's look at how that data looked when you stayed on IV versus those who switched. So this is what I like about this study, is if you focus on those week, if we look at the IVC cohort, which meant you continued on your IV dose that you got uh, in induction, you could see that you sustained your response at week 12 and at week 52. Similarly, if you went and got looked at your week 12 induction with IV, and then that same group who were randomized to sub Q, Q4, the good news is you sustained your response. And this is really what we were looking for. And the same rules apply to remission. Here's your remission data, how you go into response, you maintain even with sub Q. And it's sort of feeding off of what Lizzie showed on the visible concept, which is you induce with an IV, you're able to have good durable uh, response throughout the year. So this is sort of the dosing strategy going into um, the phase three, which would be the sub Q maintenance. When you look at 
using CDAI response and remission, same concepts here where we're looking at the ability to maintain what you got to at week 12. And you could see here that patients were certainly, there's this interesting concept on the right, which is CDI remission. Don't get too caught up and wow, there's a better response in sub-Q. It's not that. It's that perhaps when you look at general well-being and you use a more subjective driven outcome, remember the data is not always going to be as consistent as you're going to see when you use more objective measures of, of your endpoint. So the good news is it sustains you, may even improve. It could be that the drug kicks in a little bit longer than week 12. We saw that with ustekinumab that there's a longer half-life. So that may be explained by why you may see a little bit of delay into maintenance, but it's always good to get good maintenance data. When we look at now the conclusion around Miracizumab for maintenance, the serenity, I want to stress the importance that patients did well at week 12 with the three IV doses, and then um, across the board, you were able to then maintain it, as we noted, looking at hard endpoints like endoscopic and PRO2 and PRO2 in addition to CDAI. Safety profile looked good. And of course, the reason why we showed it is to show you that, yay, we're going into the phase three which program, which is really important for us to get yet more options in this class of therapies for Crohn's disease patients. All right, well, that was terrific. Um, we're gonna move on now to um, Lizzie, but we have another video, so let me pull that up. This is from our colleague, Severine Vermeer. And so I'm just gonna give you a little context before we talk, before we watch this video. This video, she's going to tell us all about the riveting trial, um, but what is the riveting trial? We're shifting gears now to JAK inhibitors, and I'm going to talk, this is a tofacitative trial. Um, and if you've already probably seen presented at multiple conferences, there was a label change post-marketing in tofacitative to address the fact that there was an increased occurrence of clots in the rheumatoid arthritis population in a post-marketing study. Um, and they actually then told people to reduce the dose in rheumatoid arthritis to five milligrams twice a day. And in ulcerative colitis as well in maintenance, five milligrams twice a day was recommended. So the riveting study was to look at what happens when a stable UC patient on 10 milligrams twice a day is reduced to five milligrams twice a day. And these are the first six month data. That's a great introduction, Lizzie, thank you. In the next few minutes, I will present you the results from the double-blind randomized riveting study, which looked at the treatment outcome of tofacitinib dose reduction to 5 mg BID versus remaining on 10 mg BID in patients with ulcerative colitis in stable remission on 10 mg. So this is an ongoing phase 3 B4 double-blind randomized parallel group study. All patients receive tofacitinib 10 mg BID for two or more consecutive years within the open label extension study, they were in stable remission on that dose for six or more months prior to enrollment, and they could not have received corticosteroids for at least four weeks prior to enrollment. Patients were randomized to either remaining on tofacitinib 10 mg BID dose or to reducing their dose to 5 mg BID. And you see that there were 70 patients in each arm that were included and randomized. The primary endpoint at month six was defined as the modified Mayo score remission. And this was defined as a three component Mayo score. The endoscopic subscore could be one or zero, stool frequency subscore could be one or zero, and the rectal bleeding subscore had to be zero. And this summarizes the results. You have a number of outcomes presented here. You see always in green are the patients who reduced the dose to five milligrams BID. And in blue, you see always the patients who remained on the 10 milligrams BID dose. The primary endpoint of modified Mayo score remission is seen here in the top left. And then you see that numerically patients remaining on the 10 milligrams BID did a little bit better, but overall patients could safely and also efficiently reduce their dose to 5 mg BID without losing remission. And this was also seen for the other endpoints of total Mayo score remission, endoscopic improvement, 
clinical response and so on. So always you see that the green bars perform numerically about 10% less, uh, but um, overall the patients remain in remission. When we look at subgroup analysis, then it was clear that especially those patients with a baseline endoscopic subscore of zero and the patients who had not been um, failing TNF blockers, that these patients were especially the ones who remained well when they were reducing their dose as compared to the prior TNF inhibitor failing patients and the patients who had still an endoscopic subscore of one. So these six month data from the riveting trial showed that most patients in stable remission on tofacitinib 10 mg BID maintenance maintain remission after dose reduction to 5 mg. For those patients who reduce their dose to 5, those with a baseline endoscopic subscore of 0 and those without prior TNF inhibitor failure were most likely to remain uh, and maintain remission. There were no new safety risks identified and we feel that these findings may guide clinical management of patients with ulcerative colitis who are treated with tofacitinib. Thank you very much. All right. That was terrific. And we're going to let Lizzie continue on. And I'm going to continue on with more safety um, and TOFA data. So this is another interim analysis, uh, this time of Octave Open, which is the open label extension trial for Octave. Um, and this is as of May 2019. So if we'll go to the next slide, I'll show you first the malignancy uh, data. And this is 6.8 years of follow up on tofacitinib. And you can see this induction cohort, this is um, the initial Octave trials. There were no malignancies in the maintenance, which was Octave sustain, again, no malignancies. And in the open label, we're starting to see some malignancies. But if you look over here at the breakdown, we've had three since the last cut point, 20 total malignancies with tofacitinib. And they're all um, really in different kind of areas in the body. They're not clustering around one specific organ system, which is really reassuring um, for tofacitinib. And then if you look just at the general incidence rate here, um, the incidence rate at the last cut point was 0.69, and it's barely changed over time to now 0.75, so very stable over time. And then of note, the non-melanoma skin cancer um, is potentially the only cluster um, that we can see. And if you look through again, through the induction maintenance and overall cohort, um, you start to see some non-melanoma skin cancer even in induction. And then if you look at their risk factors, uh, nearly all of the patients had some sort of pre-existing risk factor. 17 had been on prior immunosuppressive therapy, 15 had been on TNF, um, seven had a prior non-melanoma skin cancer before um, they even started tofacitinib. And then what's not even noted here is that there was definitively an age-related um, risk to non-melanoma skin cancer, as you would expect. Um, since the last cut point, there were no new cases, again, meaning that the, the risk was very stable over time. Um, and then we'll move on actually from tofacitinib to a new um, JAK inhibitor. And so this is the data from the phase two trial for opatacitinib, again, another open label extension of Celeste. So first we'll just show you again what Celeste looked like um, to kind of orient you. And in this uh, trial, they actually had a number of different doses, five different doses of upadacitinib in addition to placebo. And then they were re-randomized to, again, different doses of upa, um, but no placebo. And then if you weren't doing well on one of the lower doses, you could be escalated in dose um, during the maintenance phase. And then the people who were able to complete their randomization without escalation of dose went straight into UPA 15 milligrams once a day. And those who needed escalation in dose went straight to 30 milligrams once a day. And then in any time of the open label extension, if they had an inadequate response, they could as well escalate to 30 milligrams. Um, and so this is through 96 months um, of data that I'll show you. So um, in total, uh, really a large number of patients actually went into the open label extension. It was 180 who were in the study and then 107 actually went into the extension trial, which is very good. Um, and I will tell you though that the analysis that I'm gonna show you is not intention to treat, but rather an observed case analysis. So keep that in mind as we look at the next numbers. Um, 
So here you can see, this is I think a little bit confusing. I'm looking at the numbers. This week zero is actually one year on UPA, and the 12 months is actually two years on UPA because this is the open label extension data. So you can see over time, there actually was a little bit of an uh, increase in some cases, um, but again, this was observed case, so it might just be showing that those doing well on the drug ended up staying on the drug, and we might be seeing that here. But overall, in some patients, it actually did really maintain response. And it is worthwhile noting that most of these patients were very refractory and they didn't have many other choices, which was probably actually the reason why so many ended up staying into the open label extension. So this is a refractory population able to stay in response. Um, and then the next one, sort of continuing on with the same sort of theme, um, we talked about tofacitinib as a JAK inhibitor and what its safety data looked like. So this is the initial safety data from UPA. Um, again, small numbers because this is a, um, an earlier trial, um, but in the 15 milligram group, um, you can see that it actually, it wasn't that different from the 30 milligram group. When we think about tofacitinib, we see a definitive um, dose response relationship to safety um, of the drug, and that's again why the label change in tofacitinib happened. Um, and then in UPA, in the rheumatoid arthritis data, we see the same sort of trend, so it's probably going to be across the board for the JAK inhibitors. Um, so if you look here at the serious infections, there were very few, um, just one in each group. Um, and then in herpes zoster, there was one in the 15 milligram group and two in the 30 milligram group. So very similar, but small numbers. So there might be a little bit of a shift with that two in the, the higher dose group. Um, notably, there were no thromboembolic events. Uh, and then there is anemia and CPK elevation, which is just tied to the, um, the mechanism of action of a JAK inhibitor. Um, so these were expected, but relatively small numbers. Um, they were definitively a little bit larger, especially that CK elevation in the 30 milligram group and led to more drug discontinuation. Um, and then just in conclusion, um, at the second year, there were sustained improvements in some in a very refractory population, and there were no new safety risks observed. It looks very similar um, to what was seen before. So it, it's a good option to have on the table. Right. So uh, an, good data on a selective JAK1 inhibitor, and Sushila is going to present another JAK1. Yes, um, we're going to move on to filgotinib, which is another um, selective JAK1 inhibitor. We're going to look at the um, results of the selection trial, which is a combined phase 2b3 double-blind placebo-controlled trial that looked at filgotinib in moderate to severely active ulcerative colitis. So this, so filgotinib is a preferential JAK1 inhibitor. It's being studied currently for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. Um, it was studied in Crohn's disease in the phase two Fitzroy study, and it was found to be superior to placebo in that study. This study, the selection phase 2b3 trial, evaluated the efficacy and safety in moderate to severely active ulcerative colitis, and we'll look at the induction study first. So for um, so initially, there was both a biologic naive and a biologic experienced cohort. Um, they were randomized to filgotinib 200 milligrams, 100 milligrams, or placebo um, in both the bio naive and experienced cohorts. The induction endpoint was at week 10. Um, and at week 10, the responders amongst each group were then re-randomized either to continue on the dose they're already receiving or um, to go on to placebo. So moving on to clinical remission at week 10, um, the filgotinib 200 milligram dose had a significant difference in achieving clinical remission in both the bio-naive and the bio-experienced groups. In endoscopic remission, once again, filgotinib 200 met its endpoint of achieving endoscopic remission, but only in the bio-naive group this time. Similarly, um, looking at histologic remission at the induction endpoint of week 10, the 200 milligram dose of filgotinib met the endpoint of achieving histologic remission um, with a Gabose index um, at week 10 and only the bio-naive treatment arm. 
And in terms of adverse events between the placebo groups and the two doses of filgotinib studied, they were fairly similar um, across the groups um, of note. Um, the infection rate was perhaps a little bit higher um, in the filgotinib 200 milligram groups than 100 milligrams or placebo. Serious infections was fairly similar um, across the groups. Um, herpes zoster, while numbers were small, um, there were three cases in the 200 milligram group and one case in the 100 milligram group, and there was one PE um, in the Philgotinib 200 milligram group. Moving on to the summary of the induction part of this study. The so selection study had both um, TNF and VETO refractory patients and patients with severe endoscopic disease. Um, the 200 milligram dose of filgotinib was effective for induction at the 10 week endpoint for both bio naive and bio experienced people when we looked um, sort of at overall um, remission and when we looked at clinical remission. However, when we looked at the endoscopic and histologic endpoint, um, we only saw a significant um, response in terms of the bio naive patients. Both the filgotinib 100 milligram and 200 milligram doses um, were well tolerated. Moving on then to the maintenance trial results. You can go to the next slide. So for maintenance, um, now looking at week 58 um, in clinical remission, <clears throat> which um, was defined as a Mayo endoscopic subscore of 0, 01, rectal bleeding subscore of 0. Um, and um, a frequency decrease in stool frequency. We can see that here, um, filgotinib 200 milligrams and 100 milligrams actually had a significant difference in clinical remission, um, which is different than what we saw at week 10 um, when we looked at week 58. Looking at the six month steroid free clinical remission, filgotinib, the 200 milligram dose had a significant difference as compared to placebo, um, but the 100 milligram dose did not. Now looking at endoscopic remission and histologic remission, um, the filgotinib 200 milligrams did have a significant difference compared to placebo in both endoscopic remission and histologic remission, though you'll see that the proportion of patients in histologic remission um, was uh, quite a bit higher than those um, that were in endoscopic um, remission. Now moving on to adverse events um, at this um, longer time point. Once again, um, safety was pretty similar amongst the groups of interest um, looking at infection um, rates in the filgotinib 200 milligram group um, compared to placebo, um, perhaps a little bit higher than the 100 milligram group. When we look at zoster, um, rates were low um, across the group. Um, PE, there were no events. Um, and um, venous thrombosis, excluding PE, there were events only in the placebo group. So in summary, um, filgotinib 200 milligrams was effective as maintenance therapy in ulcerative colitis in patients who had responded to induction um, at, 50, at week 58. It met its endpoint at all of the key secondary endpoints, including endoscopic, histologic, and six-month steroid-free remission. <clears throat> And looking at the lower 100 milligram dose, it was effective as a maintenance treatment. So it did meet its endpoint at week 58, though it had not um, at week 10. Um, both doses were well tolerated. Okay, great. Thanks, Sushila. So Marla and I are going to present the final section, which is about the S1P receptor modulator therapies. Remember, this is a novel mechanism. We haven't had a drug in IBD yet with this mechanism. And this actually inhibits activated lymphocytes from um, leaving lymph nodes. So a new mechanism for us to think about. And we're starting with ozonamod, which is currently available in the US market for relapsing multiple sclerosis. And we're gonna share the results of the True North study, which was a phase three trial in moderate to severe ulcerative colitis. And we're fortunate to have Bill Sanborn himself who recorded a video for us. The slides are delayed a little bit and when he presents the results, just uh, follow along and I'm sure it'll be clear to you. Hello, I'm Dr. Bill Sanborn from the University of California, San Diego. It's my pleasure today to present the abstract entitled OZAN for moderate to severe ulcerative colitis, efficacy, safety, and histology results from the induction and maintenance periods of the phase three True North study. By way of introduction, OZANAMOD is an oral sphingosine 1-phosphate or S1P 
receptor modulator that selectively targets S1P1 and S1P5 receptors. Ozanamod induces peripheral lymphocyte sequestration, decreasing the lymphocytes circulating to areas of inflammation, including the gut. Ozanamod was recently approved by the EMEA and FDA for the treatment for lapsing multiple sclerosis. Ozanamod demonstrated significant improvements versus placebo in endoscopic, histologic, and clinical endpoints for moderate to severe ulcerative colitis in a phase two study and has been studied in more than 3,000 people. The True North trials, a 52 week phase three clinical trial conducted to assess the efficacy and safety of ozanamod for the induction and maintenance of remission in patients with moderately to severely active ulcerative colitis. Here are the induction efficacy at week 10. The primary endpoint was clinical remission, which occurred in 18.4% of patients who received ozanamod one milligram per day and 6% of patients who received placebo. This, just, this difference was statistically significant. The ranked secondary endpoints, including clinical response, endoscopic improvement, and mutable healing were all also statistically significant. Here are the maintenance efficacy data at week 52. The primary endpoint was clinical remission, which occurred in 37% of patients who received ozanamod and 18.5% of patients who received placebo. This difference was statistically significant. Secondary endpoints included clinical response, endoscopic improvement, maintenance of remission, corticosteroid-free remission, buccal healing, and durable remission. These differences were all statistically significant. So in conclusion, in this phase three clinical trial in patients with moderately to severely active ulcerative colitis, treatment with ozanamod led to statistically significant improvements in all primary and key secondary endpoints for induction at week 10 and for maintenance at week 52. Oral ozanamod during induction and maintenance led to clinically meaningful improvements in clinical and endoscopic endpoints. Thank you for your attention. All right, well, thanks, Bill. Let me go back to my slides here. And I want to share with you the safety from the True North study at week 52, so you can see this. Now, it is understood that a therapy of this particular mechanism can increase liver uh, enzymes, and you'll notice that of the treatment emergent adverse events, it, it does include an alanine aminotransferase increase in the patients who received drug uh, compared to placebo, as well as GGT increase in those who receive drug compared to placebo. You also see the common treatment emergent adverse events that we've seen in all of our UC studies, including nasopharyngitis, headache, and arthralgias. As far as serious treatment emergent adverse events, you can uh, see that the most common was uh, ulcerative colitis exacerbation, which occurred more often in placebo than in the ozanamod arm, as you might expect. Uh, and in terms of those that led to treatment discontinuation, it was numerically more in the placebo arm, which we would also expect. So overall, uh, the safety is actually quite favorable. Uh, and looks uh, as you'd expect from a therapy that offers this type of efficacy in ulcerative colitis. However, I also have to share with you, you heard Bill mention briefly that the phase three True North study grew out of the phase two study of ozanamod, and we now have long-term safety and efficacy data from the long-term follow-up of that phase two open label extension. The design was that the patients who were in this phase two trial uh, either by completing the induction study uh, or who had uh, elected to continue on, whether they responded early or not, could be eligible for the open label extension. And you can see that the uh, study was uh, ongoing out to week 200. Looking at the partial Mayo score over time in the observed analysis, you can see that it's a stable change over time that these patients who are responding continue to do well all the way out to the week 200 mark. And you can also appreciate on the right that looking at clinical response and clinical remission, they also continue to be relatively stable with a low rate of loss of response, 
uh, or at least lower than what we've seen with our cytokine therapies, and also suggesting that perhaps the cellular mechanism of action, once patients have responded and are in remission with it, seems to be a stable mechanism over time. So the summary of this touchdown open label extension from the phase two trial demonstrates durable efficacy of ozonamide at one milligram daily on the clinical endoscopic and other measures in moderate to severe UC. There was a high rate of ongoing study participation in this long-term study with uh, four years of safety data with a new mechanism of action coming to IBD. One of the things we always wanna know about is as much safety as possible and looking at the low rates of annual discontinuation through those four years. Oops. Um, the safety was consistent with the known safety profile of ozonamide has been seen in MS previously and in the other analyses, and there were no new safety signals with this long-term follow-up. So overall, encouraging news with ozonamide. Marla's gonna tell you about the other S1P uh, therapy, etrosamide. Thanks, Dave. Yes, so in keeping with the S1P theme, we're going to um, show you now a Trasimod for uh, this is the placebo controlled ulcerative colitis phase two OASIS trial and showing you the 12 week data and then showing you the open label uh, extension data out to a year. So like what you saw with ozanamods, the mechanism of action is, is, is very similar, just slightly different receptor modulator. You can see that it also S1P4 receptor modulation as well. So each of them have a slight difference in their, um, in their modulation. So this is a study design. The original uh, blinded portion was etrazomod two milligrams versus one versus placebo. This was the 12 week blinded portion. Then those who completed week 12 were then just put on open label two milligram dosing. And we looked at the end of study period, which is at week 52. So let me show you first the um, data looking at over time. And you could see here within the 12 week, what this is just showing you, time to resolution or improvement in rectal bleeding and stool frequency. And what this is just showing you that already, like we're seeing with some of our oral small molecules, some of also our biologics in the naive group in particular, you can see separation of curve between placebo and a trazimod. I'm only showing you the two milligram arm because that's the dose that is in maintenance and that's the dose that's gonna be going forward. So we're focusing on the dose that we're gonna know to show you this data. So you could see as early as week two, separation of curves between drug and placebo in rectal bleeding. And you could start to see separation of curves at week two with a greater separation of curve for stool frequency at week four. Again, trying to get into the game of how early do these therapies actually kick in. Now I'm gonna show you what happens both at the baseline week 12 and then showing you what happened, just like I showed you with the P19s, what happens when you carry on the dose, let's say that they got to week 12 in. Here is showing you rectal bleeding um, scores, uh, the mean score and showing you the change, significant change over week 12 and then sustained out to week 52 when patients are getting the same dose. Again, showing you the stool frequency scoring. The concept is just to suggest that there's significance as you go from induction, post-induction into the open label out to week 52, showing you similar improvements. The good news is what we've shown you tonight is even in the open label or even if randomized, whatever dose or drug got you to week 12, we're seeing a sustainability. And I think that is really the great message to take home tonight is we're showing you that these therapies sustain response and remission out to a year. So the conclusion from uh, this study, from the OASIS study, is that patients with UC who received the two milligram in the clinical trial and its open label had dirt early, uh, seen as early as two weeks, specifically for rectal bleeding, and um, also durable clinical improvements. There was a symptomatic response, as we just referred to, at week two, and then sustained out to the end of treatment. And again, this is what led to us taking forward two milligrams into the phase three Elevate studies. So you've seen a lot of names tonight. There's going to be more <laughs> for all of the phase threes. I don't think anyone compete 
with the botanical names of <laughs> Echelizumab, but we'll have to see how they all look. But we wanted to just share with you, really take the opportunity to show you the excitement of what's moving forward. So Dave, why don't we summarize what we've talked about tonight and look into the drugs of the future and putting it in the context. All right, thanks, Marla. Uh, well, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight, and uh, we do have some time for questions, and there have been some good ones that have come through, but I want to just highlight with the summary now of the therapies uh, that are in the pipeline and that we've covered. Uh, it's actually a, a very exciting time, not just for uh, the new therapies coming, but also as we're learning about our existing treatments, how we might use them better. And so with that, um, I'm going to uh, open it up for q and I'll leave this up just so people have reference to the different drugs. And I'll start with a couple questions. Marla, I'm going to ask you first. Um, and, and this may be uh, fairly obvious to someone uh, like you who thinks about pediatrics compared to adults all the time. But why were the pediatric adalimumab data better than the adult adalimumab data in ulcerative colitis? I think, um, yeah, that's a great question. I think it really comes down to dosing. So as a reminder, um, someone who weighs 30 kilos, for example, who would be getting, even if you stuck with the label dose, 80 milligrams, is getting more than someone who weighs 80 kilos, as an example. So per kilogram, you're getting more. And again, given the fact that we dosed it 2.4 milligram per kilogram was the first time we actually sort of dosed ADA in that sense in induction, um, but also to a max of the on-label dose. But those people who are below sort of 40 milligrams or 70 milligrams, sorry, <laughs> someone weighs 70 milligrams, that's a problem, 70 kilograms, that um, you're going to see a more milligram per kilogram. So it's all about not using that fixed maximum dose we tend to see that. We saw that with ustekinumab as well in the pediatric study because we dosed it, you know, based on um, their weight or their body surface area. So we see that more in, in kids. So that, that is a great question. It comes down to dosing. So related to that, Marla, I'm just going to stick with you for a second because I don't know the answer to this. Did anyone look at serene, um, not based on the serum concentrations of adalimumab, but rather adjusting based on the BMI or the weight? And, you know, right. And interestingly, in ULTRA, which was the, you know, registration trial for adalimumab, we definitely saw a difference in efficacy below even 70 kilos. Again, same concept of kids is that you're getting more for your bang for your buck kind of thing based on, on weight. So because they adjusted for exposure, so being not in UC, but in Crohn's in particular, they did adjust for exposure. In the PK world, that's saying that takes into account the BMI driving exposure. And if you just target level, you're probably, it's sort of a surrogate for higher or lower BMI because you should be getting different levels based on BMI. Um, in ulcerative colitis, it could be also in the serene exploratory arm that maybe the dosing needs, the levels that we're using are not the right levels. It could be we need higher drug exposure in order to drive us above this plateau that we seem to get with all our therapies. I mean, when you look at the ustekinumab UC induction data, there's a dose response. It just tops up at the top court, you know, at the top dosing or the top quartile. I know we can move further and dose probably better and get better efficacy. You know, there is something to be said about using TDM to drive your dosing. Uh, and also looking for where else the drug might be um, in addition to the serum. I still think that looking in the stool or even in the tissue like Maria Bruce done uh, might give us some more clues, but very interesting work. All right, so Sheila, um, why uh, were patients who had used to kinemab uh, antibodies, in other words, anti-drug antibodies, not affected from their clinical response? Is it because they were not neutralizing antibodies, or is there something else we need to understand about that? Yeah, for the most part, they were not neutralizing antibodies. The, the great proportion of them were low titer antibodies, and they also noted that the antibodies seemed to be transient um, and come to go. So I, do, I think that, you know, this isn't sort of a fixed thing. Uh, we catch it at a snapshot in time, and most of them were low titer. Have you ever ordered uh, serum levels of ustekinumab in your patients? I have um, on occasion, though um, oftentimes I do, uh, you know, dose increase um, based on, um, you know, the, the scenario. Yeah. The question, 
I haven't done it very often. I, you know, I'm very reassured by that low immunogenicity, but I certainly am interested in some of these new data. I was just going to add that, you know, it could be that it's going to look like serine where your clinical acuity in these drugs, where there's not a high immunogenicity that you're going to, you know, because we don't know as much about these drugs as we do with TNF. And Lizzie published that even patients who are getting these random infusion reactions due to were not related to anti-drug antibodies. So again, this drug class, like fetalizumab, I do believe in, is different than the TNF. So I think we still need a lot of work to understand this. Uh, I, uh, of course, agree. Lizzie, a couple questions for you. The first one, people uh, want to know, when will sub veto be available? <laughs> um, this one, it's still a little bit of a moving target, but Marla has the inside scoop and said that maybe next, year, <laughs> maybe next year it will be available. So we're all crossing she our fingers. Doesn't. No, she just. I don't know. No, no, no. Seriously. It's available in Canada. In Canada. <laughs> I know my Canadian people, my roots is if you want it, it's going to be available in early. The plan is early 2021, actually, in Canada. Is it avail It is available in other parts of the world. So. I think we are hopeful that we can hopefully get the timeline moved up, but we're not sure when it will be available to us. Okay, Lizzie and Marla, question for pediatrics. Um, are you using tofacitinib in any kids? I'll let Lizzie uh, <laughs> tell, her, tell her experience here. Um, yeah, we actually, um, one of our fellows published a letter about this with our actually only partial experience now. We've used it very commonly, and we have about a 50-50 response rate in very refractory kids. I even used it um, the other day in a four-year-old, um, and it actually got her into remission, and she was not responsive to IV steroids or infliximab. Um, not to say that there's not a safety signal there, and you might want to transition if you have other options, but in a very refractory pediatric population, I think there's a definitive use. Yeah, now not we have not to, that I want to drive home all this, uh, but I want to ask you, how did you deliver it in a four-year-old? Yeah, there's um, now dosing data in uh, psoriatic arthritis. Um, so you can, I gave it in a pill. She swallows pills, the four-year-old. Um, so I gave her five milligrams, which is close to the induction dose in psoriatic arthritis for kids her size, um, which is seven, a little above seven. Um, I think Juvenile idiopathic arthritis, actually. Sorry, because oh, I don't. Sorry, think sorry. Yeah, J. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. That actually helped us know the dosing. To be fair, because the package insert is very clear based on kilograms. So there is some really good data that we're getting from pediatric okay. indication. Yeah. Um, so Sheila, why was the histologic uh, remission data for filgotinib higher than the endoscopic remission? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point. It was um, clearly higher at that um, long-term endpoint at 58 weeks. And I think there is, a, you know, a bit of a um, subjective aspect to the central reading of the endoscopic scores, too. Um, you know, what you, what um, you know, you call a one, you know, versus I call a one may be um, a little bit different, I think. So I think that, um, you know, in looking at these, quote, sort of objective endpoints, I, I do think that there is some subjective nature that we have to take into account, too. Yeah, and we've seen some really nice histologic results with TOFA, um, and that wasn't included in their original um, studies. So I think there's more to understand here, but it's interesting. Do you treat to histologic remission? I, I think that um, for the for the most part, um, clinical and endoscopic. But I think that if there is some you know dose adjustment that you can make, um, you know potentially. Yes. Yeah, so, Dave, can I ask you a question? The um, the histo versus endo. Don't you think because a zero and a one is, you know, if you looked at the relation between zero and histologic remission, don't we believe? Because one still, we look in. There's inflammation. It's right. not a two or a three, but there's inflammation. So, have we seen data on zero? The opposite, Mar. The histologic remission was higher than the endoscopic remission, and with a looser definition like the old trials had the yeah. endoscopic remission might have come out better. Higher, so yeah. it's, it's very interesting to see this. I'm not sure yet whether this is um, just an artifact of the trial design and the definitions, or like Sushila said, the way it's read, uh, yeah. or perhaps there's something more here that uh, jacks uh, do get this deep level of remission and maybe endoscopy lags behind it. Maybe we're looking at the wrong time point. I don't know. Uh, yeah. it, I just 
found that to be fascinating. And it wasn't subtle. It was seen in, in induction and in maintenance. Yeah. Um, Marla, do you think that, that dose reduction of all of our therapies in maintenance is something we should be thinking about? The JACs have explored this across the board. Uh, or is that not the right way to think about it with the MAVs? I think the MAVs, more than small molecules, really are so PK driven that I think for monoclonal antibodies, we should be focused on exposure. You know, we, we've seen this many times that when, if we all could get a patient to what we believe to be a therapeutic concentration that is associated with an objective endpoint, that's the target for that patient. And what we see is that it's not one size fits all. With the small molecules, it doesn't appear, especially with TOFA, we asked them if you remember about drug concentrations, we were all excited saying this is like 6MP and we're gonna be able to get metabolites. And they're like, there is no meta you know, exposure response difference. There's no metabolites to measure. I don't know if that will be the same for Ozanamod or the JAK1s, but we've sort of been separating exposure for biologics should be the focus and for small molecules reduction to a lower effective dose does not always work lizzie showed riveting granted that was a fda commitment so we know why that was looked at but have we ever been successful at lowering an effective dose i think you know that's not sort of the direction we've taught you know we've said maybe target a biomarker like dave you showed that calprotectin maybe there's a cut point at which you may want to de-escalate or be able to de-escalate but not completely remove yourself from the drug right that's the concept we're trying to look at right um our colleague jordan axelrad in new york asked about um whether any of these trials have changed how we're using our existing therapies uh, in other words, with some of the novel mechanisms or even just the second generation therapies like the new JAK or the P19s, does that make us think about how we're using our current therapies in any different ways or reassure us? You want to comment on that, Marla? Yeah, I mean, I'm actually very encouraged about the, I feel like even existing targets like P40 to P19, I feel like there may be even an upgrade, you know, we're getting more specific and targeted um, by specifying Jack 1, 3, and now maybe a Jack and being more selective. Again, I feel, and this is the way I talk to patients, I'm like, we're getting like version 2.0 or Uber, you know, we're getting to this more, an understanding of what drives safety, trying to simplify it, go after the targets that are dr drive efficacy. I will say, to Jordan and to anyone asking about even now about are we changing the way we use therapies, Lizzie noted we are um, adventurous at Mount Sinai when it comes to pediatrics, but I think combination therapy and sequencing of therapies is something we're thinking more about than we ever have before because we finally had a small molecule that we could use intermittently, mixing it. And Dave, you know, you talked about using, um, you know, bridges to veto. I think we've we've become more uh, comfortable using a small molecule as a bridge to something that has a better long-term safety profile and using it instead of corticosteroids or in a steroid refractory. That's what I'm taking away a lot from these studies is learning where I can use drugs as a more rapid onset, maybe intermittently, on a background of safety, durable biologic. That's how I'm thinking about things. And I think we have to see where that goes when we have a lot of toys in our toy chests and figure out you know, how we use them and sequence definitively is gonna matter. You're gonna see a lot of the orals have a high bio naive population actually. And so I think we all have to sort of think, are we gonna move these orals earlier and does it make sense to use them earlier, either in combo or instead of? And I think that's what the next five years needs to be thinking about, is how are we gonna use these, right? That is important for our patients. Last question. Marla, do you know, I don't know what the um, PADUFA date or whether it's even been submitted is, sub-Q and fliximab. Oh, yes. Um, the biosimilar sub-Q and fliximab, that's sort of on the same shelf as the Vito sub-Q. Um, so I don't know, again, um, we, and Dave, maybe you can talk about that, you know, we as an international society felt during COVID, this was a time where we wanted to push things, and Maria has been, you know, a champion for that 
um, through IOIBD and saying, you know, now's the time where we need access to therapies such as sub-Q. Um, so hopefully they heard us and hopefully that's going to make well, a difference. Hear us and they replied and said, um, we're not speeding things up. <laughs> <laughs> so um, look how effective we were at telling people. Responded. Um, we were surprised that they replied. It, the IOIBD group sent a letter. <laughs> okay, well, with that, uh, I want to just thank, first of all, uh, both Dr. Spencer and Dr. Dalal for their excellent contributions tonight, as well as all of our uh, video and pre recorded colleagues. And uh, as always, my partner, Marla, and Debbie Palestina, our executive director, who introduced the program tonight.